record. All right, welcome everybody to today's HLA webinar, Catching Kids Before They Fall, Pedi Pediatric Late Onset Hearing Loss. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amanda Watson and I'm the HLA meeting planner. Um, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for playback at a later time on the HLA website, hearingloss.org. And I will start by giving you a few tech tips. To see captions on this webinar, you will need to click on the CC icon and click show subtitle. You can change the, the font size in subtitle settings. Chat is available for technical issues and panelists only. We would like participants to please use the Q&A icon to ask questions. We will use this to facilitate questions and answers after the presentation. If you've joined by computer, the presentations should be in side-by-side -side mode. Slides are on the left and panelists are on the right in gallery view. You can change the size of your side-by-side -side view by hovering between the two screens and moving the gray bar to adjust to your desired size. If you join by mobile device or phone, your view may be different and you may have to scroll between views to your desired one. Uh, first, I will introduce all of our panelists today. First, uh, Justin Osman is a CEO and founder of the Olive Osman Hearing Fund, and he's a very popular motivational speaker. He is also the co-founder of the Late Onset Hearing Loss Awareness Campaign and has devoted his life to bringing hope and help to people with hearing loss in historically underserved communities in undeveloped countries. We also have Dr. Chrissy Eubanks. She's a clinical audiologist at the Longwood Speech, Hearing, and Learning Center at Longwood University in Virginia, where she also teaches the undergraduate audiology course. Dr. Eubanks serves as an, the audiologist a faculty member for the Virginia State Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities LEND program and is an active member and former chair of the Virginia ED, EHDI Programs Advisory Committee. Last but definitely not least, Valerie James Abbott. She is an award-winning author, a parent champion for early hearing detection and intervention, and co-founder of the Late Onset Hearing Loss Awareness Campaign. She is currently co-chair of the Virginia EHDI Programs Advisory Committee and works at the Center for Family Involvement, supporting families of children recently identified as deaf and hard of hearing. So first, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, Valerie, Valerie will go ahead and show, uh, share her screen. And I will pass it over to Justin, who will begin the presentation. All right, welcome everybody. Good to have you with us from wherever you are all across the country, around the world possibly. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, thank you, Amanda, for the, for the beautiful welcome, the introduction. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful cause that we're all embarked on uh, for, this, um, for this cause. And uh, for all who are participating, whatever background you come from, welcome and thank you for making the time to learn and uh, to, to get educated uh, to be informed about this very important card that we're that we're about to talk about today uh just a little background on myself uh i'm justin eisman i come from a musical family you might have heard of the eisman family <laughs> we're a little bit of country we're a little bit rock and roll but we're a little bit of helping people here too and to make a difference in that area uh, how it all started for me, uh, hearing loss runs in our family. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, so we know firsthand the importance of being able to hear, to be able to communicate, to understand, and to be able to connect uh, with people, uh, our families, our loved ones, all across the board. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because everybody here knows and understands that. Um, but with my family, uh, just one of the untold stories of my family, my grandmother, uh, Olive Eisman, that you see here on the screen, I was her favorite grandchild, but I'll tell you why in just a second. Uh, but her two oldest boys were born deaf. And, um, and then she, her doctors told her not to have any more children 
uh, because then it would be a genetic thing and they would all be born with a hearing loss. Thank goodness my grandmother didn't listen. She had seven more children, nine children total. And that's where, that's where the Ivan family came about. But what's interesting about this is, as many of you know who have children, it, it, it's a lot of money to raise a, a big family. And they didn't, my grandmother didn't have any money to, to buy and push this hearing aid for her two older sons that were born deaf. So my grandpa, George, he, uh, he rounded up some of his other boys that could hear and they, he noticed that they had a gift that they could sing, they could dance, they could entertain. So what they did is they formed a barbershop quartet called the Eisman Brothers. And my dad was the lead singer at that group. And the, the, the reason why they started singing and performing was that they can go out there and raise money so that they could purchase hearing aid for their two older brothers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the Osmond family got started in show business. We knew the importance of being able to hear, to understand, to communicate with our family and loved ones. And so our family, the Osmonds, were huge advocates uh, for supporting hearing health awareness. Um, and so we're, we're honored to be here and be, be a part of this wonderful campaign uh, for late onset hearing loss. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I'm so excited uh, to talk more about this. Uh, we have some wonderful guests here, uh, Valerie <coughs> and Christine Eubanks, uh, that are going to join us here to talk a little bit more about their experience and, and whatnot. But having said that, uh, I'd like to introduce Valerie. And Valerie, if you wouldn't mind jumping on here and just sharing, a little, sharing with us a little bit more about you, your background, your information, and how you got involved with all of this. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Justin. I am adjusting my page a little bit. So thank you all so much um, for the invitation to join you today. Um, Justin and I have something in common and that is that hearing loss runs in our family. Only when we started our journey, we didn't know that. <laughs> um, so some families begin their journey with pediatric hearing loss at the time that their baby is born at birth. And that's when a newborn hearing screen indicates that the child needs additional audiological testing. And that is when the child is identified as deaf or hard of hearing. Our experience was different, but not all that uncommon. So this is my youngest daughter when she was a baby, Bridie. She entered the world in May of 2005, um, a very happy, healthy, um, not small newborn. <laughs> she was nearly nine pounds. And before leaving the hospital, she passed her newborn hearing screen. Um, I have no memory of that test. Uh, we do believe that when she was born, she did have hearing. Um, and we believe that the hearing screening results were accurate. Um, and she did pass that newborn hearing screening. So when we brought her home, we honestly never thought about her hearing health again. She was um, very happy, very healthy. She didn't sleep that well, which meant I didn't sleep that well. But other than that, we just brought her home and raised her along with her older sister as a typical family of four, enjoying and surviving parenthood. <clears throat> so as Bridie got older, she continued to thrive. Um, she continued to be super healthy and super happy. She was very energetic, very friendly. She'd never met a stranger. She loved to play and dance and babble. And we rarely brought her to the pediatrician um, because she was never sick. Yes, we did go to well baby visits, um, annual checkups and things. We got her vaccinations done, um, but that was really it. We know that she had never had an ear infection. She'd never had a ma major fever. We had no reason to have hearing health on our radar as something to keep, um, to keep our finger on. What we do know is that it was sometime during this period between infancy and toddlerhood that her hearing status changed. And we don't know exactly when that happened. Um, we don't know if one day she woke up and her hearing was different or if it was a slow progressive process, but it was definitely in this window and none of us noticed. So um, we decided when she was two and a half to enroll her in preschool. It was the same preschool where our older child had gone. And um, she started in September of 2007. And she could not wait. There was no separation anxiety, quite the opposite. She ran into that school 
um, feeling like she owned the place, her independent spirit was in full display. And it was about six months later during a parent-teacher conference in February that her preschool teacher shared some concerns with us. Her preschool teacher asked us if we had difficulty understanding Bridie when she talked. And we said, sometimes, you know, sometimes we do, but isn't that normal? Um, she told us that Bridie did not know her colors. She did not know her numbers. She told us that her speech was not improving at the same rate as her peer group in her class. And she told us that she was refusing to sit still in circle time when, um, as many of you know, that's when the children all sit in a circle and they're either listening to a story together or having a conversation or doing some kind of activity as a group. She would not sit with them. So upon this teacher's recommendation, we reached out to our county early intervention office and we requested a speech evaluation. Prior to this, I had never heard of early intervention, which is frequently known as EI. Um, I was not overly concerned about this meeting. I figured, okay, so she might need a little speech therapy. That was not going to be a big deal. But it was during that intake meeting in our home that it became apparent we were probably looking at a significant hearing issue. And so our EI office set up a diagnostic evaluation with a local audiologist. And within a few weeks, we confirmed without question that she had a moderate to severe bilateral sensory neural hearing loss and we ordered hearing aids and she began um, extensive and intensive speech and auditory verbal therapies. We were a mess. I was certainly a mess and I had a lot of questions that could not be answered, including how did this happen? When did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, no one could tell us. I suddenly inherited a backpack that was filled with guilt and panic. And I carried that for a long time because I thought that I should have and could have noticed the signs sooner. And I like many, many families didn't know anything about pediatric hearing loss. And that is a big part of why I became passionate years later about um, improving widespread community awareness. Uh, turning her language skills around in time for her to enter kindergarten with her age group um, required that she be developmentally ready. And it took two solid years of uh, really hard work. And I always wondered whether or not we would have discovered her hearing loss on our own if her preschool teacher had not called some um, behaviors to our attention. So with that, um, I'd love to pass it over to um, Dr. Eubanks to talk to us about the topic of hearing loss in children. Thank you. My part here is to talk about some things that you may already know about hearing loss and maybe to tell you some things that you don't already know. So these are the three main categories of childhood hearing loss. The first is hearing loss that's present at birth and that's known as congenital hearing loss. And that's what we screen for during newborn hearing screenings. Then there's late onset hearing loss and that's hearing loss that begins after birth and frequently has some sort of external cause. Child has meningitis, they lose their hearing, something like that. Then there's progressive hearing loss and that can be hearing loss that is there for a reason, a genetic cause that maybe there was normal hearing early on and it changes over time. So let's go on to the next slide. So all states in the United States since 1992, all states are required to do universal newborn hearing screening. So every baby that's born in a hospital has their hearing screened and the results are reported to the state, how many babies are born, how many pass, how many don't pass and how many are not tested. And there are reasons that babies aren't tested and they're, we're, we're supposed to keep track of those numbers. And there are babies that are born with what are called risk factors. And I'll talk about some of those in a second, but those babies are supposed to be monitored even if they pass the newborn hearing screening. So we'll go on to the next slide. So newborn hearing screening does a really good job of identifying children that have 
hearing loss that's greater than a mild level. That's what screenings are. You're looking for problems that are there or developing that don't have symptoms yet. And we have all done health-related screenings, but newborn babies, they don't have symptoms yet, so we do these screenings. But there are still children who fall through the cracks. The children that have mild hearing losses sometimes pass a newborn screening because that's what happens during a screening. You miss some of those kids. They may be, like Bridey, pass the initial hearing screening, but have a progressive hearing loss that we don't detect until later, or a hearing loss comes on due to some external cause. Some babies aren't screened at all, and home births are a big category that we are working on, working with midwives to um, recommend that families go get a hearing screening after the baby is born. But then we have this large category of what's referred to as loss to follow-up. And sometimes that's children who should have been referred for follow-up who weren't referred, or the referral was delayed for any number of reasons, or they miss appointments and the detection of a problem happens later. And sometimes these are problems re related to how the data was entered into the state database or whether um, someone tried to contact the family and their cell phone wasn't taking calls or they had the wrong number. There's all kinds of reasons why follow-up doesn't happen. And sometimes it has to do with geography. There are families who live in rural areas or you know, otherwise don't have a pediatric audiologist available to do the testing, maybe for two or three hours drive. If you live out in a rural area, you may have to go across the mountains for a test. And maybe that's not a priority when you have a brand new baby. So there are lots of reasons why these kids are, get missed. So let's go on to the next slide. So we talked about risk factors. Some of the risk factors are sort of apparent right off the bat. There are babies that are born and are in the NICU, which is the neonatal ICU, maybe because they were premature, they had some infection during uh, the birth process, um, they um, maybe had something that was identified, or they had an infection that wasn't identified yet. And, and I think Valerie will talk about CMV in a little bit. There are hearing losses that run in families. So once you have a child with hearing loss, you're sort of, you have it in your mind that this runs in our family. And so that becomes a risk factor. So even if the child passes, later on, we're gonna monitor their hearing. There are certain uh, conditions that are very apparent at birth. Um, craniofacial anomalies are any difference in facial features, like for example, cleft palate, where it's known at birth and those babies are already going to be monitored. There are medications that are given to babies when they're born. Um, head trauma, they still use forceps for delivering babies. So that does happen sometimes at that time of, of birth. Um, and then there are things that happen after a baby is born during early childhood that are related to um, hearing loss. And we'll talk about that too. So on to the next slide. So uh, what I talked about, some of those conditions like cleft palate or Down syndrome, where um, the family is aware that um, they have medical appointments and they're following up on things like with a cleft palate, they're having surgeries to repair the palate and they know that there's speech therapy that might need to happen down the line, but maybe hearing isn't on their radar. And kids with cleft, pal cleft palate are actually more prone to hearing problems. So we want to monitor those kids. Another category that often falls through the cracks are kids who are born with hearing loss in one ear. Because I think the, it's always been said you know, for years, oh, if you have one good ear, that's enough. And we know now that children listening in a classroom or overhearing what their kids, their friends are saying, um, if you only have one hearing in one ear, you're at a disadvantage. And the other thing that we know now that we've been doing newborn hearing screenings is that frequently children that are born with hearing loss in one ear and a normal ear on the other side, that ear sometimes develops progressive hearing loss. And so you can't count on the hearing in the normal 
hearing ear to stay normal. So we know that those children are at risk and we need to monitor them too. Go on to the next slide. So here are some things that maybe you don't know. Just as many children lose their hearing in early childhood as those who are identified through newborn hearing screening. And that was a big surprise to us after we had some decades of uh, newborn hearing screening data. So the incidence of hearing loss actually doubles between birth and school age. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. But when the CDC did some studies and found that nearly 15% of children ages six to 19 have hearing loss, that was a big surprise. Um, a lot of these children were not getting services. Their hearing loss symptoms were subtle enough and mimicked other things that they were maybe missed or misdiagnosed. And then if they were in certain um, categories where they didn't get good follow-up or um, healthcare just generally, there are some communities, for example, the Hispanic community in the US, the incidence of hearing loss is higher in those communities. And sometimes that has to do with inherent risk factors, but sometimes it has to do with access to healthcare. And so hearing loss is more common in childhood than people recognize, and it's not being identified. So why would that be? So let's go to the next slide. So Valerie talked already about some of the signs that she noticed in Bridie. And she had a really sharp preschool teacher who brought those to her attention and knew Bridie well enough to know that behavior problems were something that needed to be addressed because there could be an underlying issue. Not everyone realizes that. Some kids get tagged with a behavior problem label and never get a hearing test and never get any evaluation. And it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Um, some kids don't develop speech for other reasons. And we know that. And some children have speech that's difficult to understand. And like Valerie said, she thought, oh, well, we'll have speech therapy. Some kids get speech therapy for years before they have a hearing test and find out that the reason that their speech isn't clear is because they weren't hearing clearly. Some children turn up the TV or ignore you or they're frustrated or they have a short attention span. And there's other reasons that explain that. But that's why we have early intervention. We identify those children who have all these common signs and do all the diagnostic testing that needs to be done so we can determine, is it ADHD, is it autism, or is it hearing loss? So we'll go to the next slide. And even when some of the tests are done, like for example, a baby is born, has a newborn screening and doesn't pass. They go home with their new baby and they have appointments to do follow-up testing. There are people in our lives who want us to feel better. They, they are mean well. They are trying to have us not worry. And so we hear all the time from parents who say, well, my sister-in-law said, oh, my son failed that test and he's just fine. Or, oh, it's probably just fluid. Or she passed the newborn screening, so she's fine. You know, I know they want you to come back in a year, but I, you know, don't worry about that. Or we don't have deafness in our family. Valerie didn't know that there was deafness in her family. Unfortunately, sometimes some of the professionals in our lives fall into that category. And we've heard stories about pediatricians or teachers saying, oh, I would know if she had a hearing loss or, oh, it's probably just fluid or let's retest her in a month or three months or six months. So they, they mean well, but they cause delays in the process. So let's go to the next slide. So if we don't identify hearing loss when it exists in childhood, there are all sorts of negative impacts and not just on speech and language acquisition, because in order to socialize, go to school and learn, you know, if you don't have language, it's hard to learn to read. It's hard to, Bridie didn't know her colors. She couldn't, didn't know her numbers. 
cognitive growth is affected, educational achievement is affected, ultimately uh, vocational achievement is affected. So these are all the reasons why we really want to make people aware that late onset hearing loss occurs. And so now I'm gonna send it back to Valerie. Thank you so much, Christine. <clears throat> So for all of us, right, every single one of us that's on here today, um, in March of 2020, the planet changed. I don't know about you all, but my planet came off its axis. Um, COVID arrived and things were radically different. Between 2020 and 2022, several states conducted research to determine the impacts that COVID-19 had on newborn hearing screening. And some of those reports highlighted pre-existing problems with identification processes that were present before COVID. For example, how many newborns who failed the newborn hearing screen never completed a diagnostic evaluation? How many infants or young children with known risk factors missed the suggested rescreening that the CDC recommends? And how many asymptomatic newborns with CCMV, which is also known as congenital cytomegalovirus, um, acquired hearing loss later in their lives during COVID, but we didn't pick up on it. So I had a theory very early on during the pandemic, as preschools and daycares were closing and we all stopped taking our children shopping, we stopped sending them to play dates. Um, as the world literally shut down, I became concerned, and I would say maybe a little obsessed, about children like mine who were discovered because a wise preschool teacher noticed problems with her speech and said something to us, her parents. So I theorized that families, pediatricians, preschool teachers, daycare workers would disregard or dismiss language, speech, and other developmental delays or social, emotional, or behavioral concerns and attribute them to problems caused by life during COVID, right? Life with masks on, instead of possible hearing loss. And I theorized that more children would be falling through the cracks now than before, simply because all of us would be letting these assumptions, these assumptions lead us in the wrong direction. So these are some of the questions that I started asking myself and others. How many children did not return to traditional preschools um, where often, very often, they are the people who identify um, concerns with language or developmental delays? How many children are missing pediatric well visits? Their children are healthy, they're just not bringing them in. How many children miss the kindergarten or first grade screening because their kindergarten class was online? How many children have entered the US over the last two years from countries that either don't conduct infant hearing screening um, or there's no record of it or they don't prioritize pediatric hearing health when they enter this country? There are other things that are on their mind. And then how many children with otitis media or chronic ear fluid did not receive proper treatment and as a result have damage to their hearing? So these were some of the questions that, that came to me in the beginning of the pandemic. It was the combination of our family's firsthand experience with late onset hearing loss and the mistakes that we made and the lessons that we learned plus the systemic problems that COVID highlighted and the new pro, 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 uh, problems that COVID created that ultimately led to the creation of the Late Onset Hearing Loss Awareness Campaign. So this is where a unexpected but incredible friendship uh, started. So Justin and I started talking about this um, idea in late 2020. We both uh, realized that we were sharing the same concerns about children during the pandemic. And we were surprised to learn that no organization to date had really devoted itself to this topic, specifically about um, increasing community awareness. We knew that May was Better Hearing and Speech Month and that other months, they highlighted other things. For example, um, deaf awareness 
deaf culture, deaf history, but the topic of pediatric hearing loss that occurs later in a child's life was just not generally discussed. And so if it's not generally discussed and widely discussed, how do people even know that it exists? Um, so we set out to change that. It was in May of last year, 2021, that Justin and I conducted a soft launch of the campaign. And over the last 12 months, the interest in this has grown significantly, far faster than we expected it would. It's been endorsed by the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management and supported by agencies such as the American Cochlear Implant Alliance, the National CMB Foundation, and the Hearing Loss Association of America. And we have been really fortunate to have these really incredible influential um, organizations help us um, spread awareness. And today is a good example of that. Justin, would you have anything to add to that before I jump into the mission? Oh, I'm just, uh, you're saying everything perfect. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, just, just so grateful, thankful, and honored uh, to be associated with you and your wonderful team. Uh, I think together we can do so much good, uh, be a force for good. Um, and, and I agree, everything you're saying here is spot on. So I'll, I'll, I'll add some more comments later on, but you're on a roll. Keep on going, my friend. All right, <laughs> we'll keep going. So the number one mission, the primary mission of the Late Onset Hearing Loss Awareness Campaign is to improve postnatal hearing loss identification rates of children from birth through school age by raising community awareness, um, specifically about the prevalence, risk factors, signs, and consequences of late identification. These babies, these children are right in front of us. We see them every day and yet we don't know that their hearing status has changed. We believe that with your help, everyone who's here today, it's going to, create, it's going to uh, require a village or an army of people. We believe that increased community awareness and specific calls to action will increase the number of children who are screened for hearing loss, but also for CCMV, which is the number one non-genetic cause of pediatric hearing loss in the United States. We expect that it would grow early intervention enrollment and Part B enrollment. We believe that it will reduce the severity of speech, language, and other developmental delays if we find these kids sooner. We believe that it will improve kindergarten readiness and success, which really is the foundation of academic success after kindergarten. That we can connect families to family support organizations sooner. And that's a really important thing for families of children who are identified as deaf or hard of hearing. Connecting with other families who are just a couple steps ahead of us really does make the journey easier. And lastly, we want all children who are deaf and hard of hearing to have positive outcomes um, at home, at school, and in life. We do know that outcomes of children who are identified through the newborn hearing screening program in general, they have outstanding outcomes, especially when um, uh, when their families continue on and, and um, make decisions about language acquisition and how to address their needs. We can do the same thing for children with late onset. So Justin, where can people find more information about the campaign? Okay, thank you, Valerie, uh, so much for informing us, educating us, and, uh, and helping us ignite the fire. You definitely ignited the fire within me to, to not only take notice, but to take action. And same with you, Dr. Eubanks. Thank you for all your, your experience and, and know-how and helping us understand how we can grab this, take notice, and, and go out there and make a difference. And so all of those combined, it just, it, it's just crucial information for all of us to understand. You know, my grandmother, Olive, she had no resources back then. Um, you know, she, she, she uh, and I, I didn't even tell the story of how the Olive Eyes and Hearing Foundation came about. Um, if, I, if I may, let me just give you a quick background. I told you about my family and how we, we understand the importance of being able to hear, but how the Olive Eyes and Hearing Fund came about. So Olive Eyes and my grandmother, she's the matriarch of the, of the musical Eyes family. And when she found out that her two deaf boys 
were born with a genetic hearing loss, she started a charity called the Eisman Foundation. And that was primarily set up to help um, for causes like what we're doing today, to help other children, to help other families understand, gather resources, uh, data, content, whatever we could do to help uh, our children have a better quality of life. And that Osmond Foundation grew and it's now known today as the Children's Miracle Network. You might have heard of the CMN hospitals all over the world. My grandmother, my sweet little uh, grandmother Olive was uh, one of the co-founders of that. And so I come along and I'm the only one in the whole second generation uh, of the Osmond family. And there's a lot of it, trust me, that was born with this, uh, with this uh, severe to profound hearing loss. And because, like Dr. Eubanks previously talked about, um, there was no newborn screening uh, back then when I was born. And so I fell through the cracks. And I was one of the late onset hearing loss uh, participants. And I wasn't even diagnosed until I was almost two years old. So for almost two years of living in a world of complete silence, not being able to develop cognitively, uh, emotionally. Uh, I was two years behind my peers. So I ended up taking about 13, almost 14 years of speech therapy, trying to catch up um, you know, with my own peers. Even today, I feel like I'm still catching up. And that's why um, when, my, when my grandmother passed away, I wanted to carry her legacy. And I started the charity in honor of my sweet grandmother, the Olive Eisman Hearing Fund, to help raise awareness and campaigns like what we're talking about today. So when Valerie uh, approached me with this idea, I was all over it because I know what it's like. I was one of those that fell through the cracks. And we want to do whatever we can so that we can prevent that from happening to our, our future children and, and to our loved ones and family and friends. So with that, you can find more information uh, to answer Valerie's question on the, uh, the Olive Eisman Hearing Fund website. You can go to www.hearingfund.org. And we'll be updating that more uh, as we go along. Uh, but for, for now, please go there, get familiar with it, and get more familiar with all the information data that we just shared with you guys today. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So how can you make how can you make a difference? Um, so this this campaign uh, really is all about um, uh, getting more data, becoming more informed, uh, becoming more educated, and and then once we know, share it, share it with your family and friends. This is this is the stigma that needs to to break down and 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 to get get the word out. This is why we're doing this webinar today. We want to share what we know, what we know works, and what we can do to help prevent that from happening. Uh, for example, uh, we know that prenatal care improves the health of both the mother and the baby. And if we, if we can prevent low birth weight and CMV infection, we can also reduce the pediatric hearing loss. See, I didn't even know that. Uh, but all this stuff is, is important to know and understand. So, but in other cases, some hearing loss is, is not preventable. Like in my case, it's generic. Uh, it, it, uh, I'm sorry, not, yeah, it's generic. Um, so if hearing loss uh, runs in your family, why not talk about it? You know, in our family, uh, the Eisman, we love talking about it. We're not, we're not afraid to talk about it. We're not ashamed of it. We're actually proud of it. And um, I know at one point it wasn't so cool to talk about it, but I've learned that if, if you can make yourself vulnerable to others, it gives other people permission to do the same. So talk about it, share about it. It's a good thing. All right, the next slide. Um, in addition to, um, to, to prenatal care, postnatal care is also important and that can make a huge difference, uh, making sure the aftercare is always uh, looked after, making sure that they're, they're taken care of. Um, don't ignore uh, ear infection. That's a big thing, that's a big deal. If, if we ignore them, it could lead to all sorts of different things that we don't wanna go there. So if you see something, notice it, take action, do something about it, uh, address, chronic ear infection early. If you notice it, again, take action. Uh, make sure you protect babies from loud noise. 
uh, an infection like meningitis. And I'll just say that uh, I don't think my parents did a very good job of that because they always took me to my dad's rocking live concerts, um, even at the New York Madison Square Garden with all the 25,000 screaming fans. So I don't know if that was the most healthy thing to do for me as a baby, but we've learned our lesson. Make sure you protect your kids from loud noise. We live in a world today that's so much noise. So protect, protect our kids here, especially at a young age. Um, know the most common risk factors. I know Dr. Eubank uh, talked about that a little bit. And, and be observant. Watch your baby's development. And you're, you're gonna notice things there and there. For my mom, uh, they didn't have the newborn screening. It wasn't until, I, like I said, I was almost two years old. She noticed I was playing in the sandbox with my, with my siblings and she uh, came out to say it was time for lunch. Everybody responded except me. So my mom noticed there was something wrong and that's when they took me in and diagnosed me and got me some hearing devices, ASAP. So basically we just need to be more aware of the things that can impact our children and their hearing and, and be able to be open about it, to share about it and to talk about it. Okay, next slide. So, so basically that, just, just being here today, you guys, just being here watching this speaks volume. And I want to say, tell you that, that because you're here, you are part of this mission and you're part of the solution, the remedy on how we can tackle this and resolve this and, and get to the bottom of this so that we can help more children uh, with late onset hearing loss. So you're now a little bit more informed more educated and hopefully a little bit more motivated. I don't know about you, but just hearing Valerie and, and Dr. Eubanks, um, it, just, it just gives the fire in my bones, want to, to, to do more and to take action and not only take notice, but to take action and to not and taking action by sharing what you know. So if, if we all pay a little bit more attention to the children in our lives and speak up when we have a concern, just imagine the number of kids we can find sooner by simply asking if they can get a new hearing evaluation. Wouldn't that be amazing to help more kids that way? I'm, I'm excited. So thank you everybody for being here today, for being a part of this uh, campaign. Can't thank you guys enough. Super, thank you so much, Justin. So we have just shared a lot of information in a very short period of time. And we would love to answer any questions or hear any feedback that you have um, that you have about this campaign or um, whatever comes to mind. So uh, we're gonna use the chat feature, I believe, or the Q&A feature, excuse me, the Q&A feature um, to uh, look at questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, the other thing I'll mention before we jump into that is anyone who has any questions about the campaign itself or how you might get involved um, is well, you're welcome to contact me at ValerieJamesAbbott at gmail.com. If you have specific questions for um, Dr. Eubanks or Justin, I could forward those along to them, but um, I wanted you to have this information before we jump into Q&A. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Hopefully this works this way. Okay, great. And um, I'm gonna take a peek at the Q&A and see, oh, we have a couple that are coming in. Oh, we have more than a couple coming in, terrific. Let's see. I'm gonna move this over to the side, okay. Um, so first question that I see is, um, will we be providing uh, copies of this PowerPoint? Um, so I'm going to ask our friends, um, Amanda, what is the best way for people to get a copy of our PowerPoint? Is that through you or through us? So we can um, post a copy of your PowerPoint with the recording. So if you send that over and when we post a recording to the HLA website, we can have a copy of your PowerPoint as well. Terrific. And then we have another question. Will this information be recorded for a later viewing? I joined a few minutes late. Yes, this is being recorded and it will be posted. Um, I'm not quite sure how quickly it will be posted, but it will be posted on the HLAA website. Um, Amanda, I'm gonna ask if you don't mind to come back on and tell the people where they'll be able to find it. Sure, let me post the link in the um, in the chat for everyone so they know, um, you know, our turnaround time, we're very busy, uh, a week or two, it'll be up there. Okay, terrific. 
The other thing I'll mention is that we do have an active Facebook and Instagram page. And when this is up and running, um, we'll be promoting that and showing that um, out uh, on social media. So if you're not already following us on Facebook or Instagram, we would encourage you to do that. Um, so yes, so uh, another question about will it be posted somewhere? Yes, it will be posted on the Hearing Loss Association of America website. Uh, is there an outreach program plan to empower pediatricians to have OAE screeners for well child checkups and or the importance to refer for diagnostic audiology when a baby refers from the NHS? So this is where it starts with all of us, right? <laughs> um, we don't have a giant team of, of employees pu pushing this campaign. It's, it's people like you and people like me. So um, we are doing outreach, but we're relying on people to reach out to us and say, can we be part of it? And so, yes, um, outreach is part of this, um, but it's gonna require enthusiastic and supportive people like you to help us um, as boots on the ground. All right, I'm interested in understanding whether newborns, infants, et cetera, experience loud noise as adults do or whether their ear physiology is somehow different? Dr. Eubanks, I think that's a great question for you. Our inner ear is already developed at about eight weeks in utero. I mean, it is there and it functions exactly the same way from then on. And so you're just as susceptible to loud noise as a baby as you are as an adult. And so noise exposure is a problem. Uh, every time I'm sitting in traffic and a car pulls up next to me and I can feel the music and, and the, it's boom box inside the car and I look over and there's children in the car, I want to, I need a sign that says, turn down your music. Nah, I, music's great and, and you can turn it up, but not as loud as that. And, uh, you know, there's, so many sources of noise and they're all additive. So working with power tools, mowing your lawn, going to a concert, playing in a band, playing in a classical band, you know, a French horn is pretty loud too. So it doesn't even, you know, it doesn't have to be rock and roll. Um, it, there's a lot of noise in the world and, you know, the, um, the earplugs are readily available and, and, uh, headphones. So, um, and don't wear your earbuds in the gym and turn your music up so, so that you hear your music and not the music that's playing overhead because then it's twice as loud and you're really at risk. All good, all good advice. We have another question. Um, you mentioned the babies who missed the screenings in preschool, kindergarten. Is there any formal plan for how to screen them if they are in public schools? So I can't speak directly to that. Um, Dr. Eubanks, do you know what, at least in Virginia, what the plan has been or how children? I, yeah, been I think children get screened at periodically and it's different in different school districts. Some districts um, screen them again in the third grade and again in the fifth, you know, it, I think it varies depending on where you live and um, getting even school districts within a state to agree on anything much less across the country is, is uh, quite a challenge. So um, yeah, I think sometimes you rely on uh, your pediatrician making a referral to an, a center uh, outside the school district. So what I know, at least here in Virginia, in the county where I live and every place is different, right? is that generally speaking, after children pass their newborn hearing screen, they are not screened again until kindergarten or um, first grade entry. That's part of the kind of onboarding process. Um, there are several other things that happen before children begin public school. Um, there are a few exceptions to that. After that, um, there might be a screening in middle school. There is a screening in high school. So the maximum number of times that a child's hearing is going to be screened by the time they graduate from high school, after birth is three times. And they're not using, you know, I mean, they're using equipment that's good, but it's not gold standard. Uh, and so um, I, would, I would encourage you to take this, if that is something that you feel passionate about, and to say, we need to talk about 
more frequent screenings of children in our public school system. And that's what we want this campaign to do is to light a fire within each of us that is going to be different. And to say, we want to see change here. This is an issue here. And for each of us to have an opportunity to be a leader. So John asks in New York City, schools are not required to screen for hearing loss. Our New York City chapter of HLAA is working to change this. Do you have data that will help support this initiative? Um, so you can reach out to me directly, John, um, and I can point you in the direction of where to find some data that might be helpful for you, because that's specific to New York City. But the, the good news is that by being connected to this campaign, we can all leverage each other's um, knowledge. Um, and, and, and that's part of it is we're trying to build an army in every state and US territory of people who see gaps in their communities. Um, I would love to learn more about how this information is being shared with Latino communities. Is any of your campaign marketing available in Spanish? So um, that is a next step. And that is a next step that will require some funding. So um, at this time, no. Um, but that is on the radar. And so I would encourage you to, to stay tuned. You can reach out to me directly, um, ValerieJamesAbbott at gmail.com if you would like to be part of the beginning process of getting our information out to Latino communities because, um, because you are at increased risk, right? And we need, to, we need to address that. We have some amazing questions. These are so good. Talking about the stigma of hearing loss, all the ads for hearing aids are about how small they are, basically saying, hide your hearing aids. I hate those ads. What can we do to create more awareness? I'm gonna pass this over to Justin, because I think you would be a great one to answer this. I'll just, I'll just say that people will soon find out that a hearing loss is more obvious than a hearing aid, meaning, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll make myself very vulnerable. When I grew up, I, I had that stigma growing up. I mean, I, I think every little kid does. Uh, but I, I soon quickly learned and found out uh, um, that being able to hear and understand was so much more important than how I looked. I mean, 40, 45 years ago, I wore the big bulky with the wire coming out of my ears uh, and then attached to a big box on my belt. That's how it was throughout my whole elementary school, middle school, and part of my high school. So I stood out like a, I stood out like a robot, if you will. Um, and, but my parents and great, uh, had great audiologists, great hearing specialists, and uh, speech language pathologists. They helped me understand that that stuff doesn't matter. It's all about connecting with life. I, I, was, I was taught early on from a psychological standpoint to always raise my hand in class if I didn't understand something. And that happened a lot. But I've also learned that it's better to be embarrassed and learn something than, than not learn anything at all. And so the whole stigma thing, I feel like it, it's starting to go away a little bit more and more. Yeah, things are getting smaller. The whole cosmetic uh, thing is. But I've got my, I've got my, my hearing aid there. Uh, on both sides, and I love it. I don't mind it at all. In fact, I'll, I'll leave it out like this, but um, the technology keeps getting better and better. And um, the, the stigma, you know, especially for young children, I, I was there, I've been there, the whole pressure, peer pressure, whatever you want to call it. Um, it it's more important to be able to hear and understand the lifestyle if you can understand more than just feeling isolated, lonely, disconnected, separated from life, separated from so many other things, all because you're worried about a little stigma um, that doesn't generate good outcomes. So um, I agree with you. We need to create more awareness on that. That's part of what I do with the Olive Eyes and Hearing Fund with Valerie and, and Dr. Eubanks. So the more voices we can get in there to help uh, spread that, um, awareness that you're talking about. I'm with you, Ellen. I hate those ads too. I'm with you, my friend. Terrific. I'll mention that my daughter is now 16, almost 17 years old. She wears bright colored hearing aids. Her most recent hearing aids were an incredible gift from the Olive Osmond Hearing Fund. Her molds right now are purple, purple and 
purple and teal swirl with glitter. She's all about glitter. So I do think a lot of it has to do with how um, families embrace this. And, um, uh, and she's always had very bright colors. Um, but I do, those ads really make me mad and they make Bridie mad too. She's like, Where, why aren't we <laughs> featuring the bright colors? We have a question um, for you, Justin. Can you tell us a little bit about the hearing aid program that your foundation has? It looks like his audio isn't working. Um, maybe direct a question to Christine for now and then come yes. back. So Dr. Eubanks, how much research has been done on ototoxic drugs that might impact children or pregnant women? I know that amoxicillin is the go-to drug for ear infections. Is that ototoxic? There's been quite a lot of research on different drugs and their ototoxic properties. And um, for example, uh, children and, and women who are pregnant who are getting chemotherapy, they're, they're very careful about, you know, you're obviously making choices. You, you have, you're taking those drugs for a reason, but they kind of give you a lot and then test your hearing. And if it seems like it's affecting hearing, then they back off on the drugs to try and, and achieve a balance of you know, therapeutic versus uh, causing hearing loss. Um, but yeah, we do definitely want people to be aware of uh, common drugs that do cause hearing loss or ringing in the ears. Like for example, people who have arthritis that take lots and lots of uh, ibuprofen, ibuprofen can cause ringing in the ears and temporary hearing loss. So um, yeah, that is, the, 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 the research is there, but the word hasn't gotten. I think yeah. Justin's back now. Yes. So Justin, can you tell us a bit about the hearing aid program of the Olive Osmond Hearing Fund? I apologize. My something went happen, but I'm I'm back on. Uh, yes. So the Olive Osmond Hearing Fund, we're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, um, charity. And so a lot of people, uh, when they have hearing aids that are obsolete or broken or no longer working, they don't know what to do with them. Sometimes they'll just throw them away or you know, do whatever, but they could actually donate them to our charity, Hearing Fund, and you get a tax write-off. Um, there's an application on the website you can fill out. Uh, you, as the donor, would be responsible for putting the value on that. Uh, you would send that in, and then we, um, what we do with each hearing aid, um, we will we have a, a, a reconditioning program that we work with different manufacturers uh, where we recondition them, uh, basically recycle them, if you will, and then we, we can reuse them again to help family that need them. Um, so that, that's the hearing aid program. And then if, if there's someone, uh, and we focus mostly on children, uh, we do help adults as well, but if there's someone that you have in mind that really could benefit from, from hearing aid that doesn't have the money, the finances, or the resources, there's also an application called the Hear to Hear program. You fill that out. And, uh, and, and then Valerie, that's kind of how we met uh, was, was through that when we helped your wonderful daughter uh, there. But there, that's our focus is helping the children. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about how the Human Aid Program works with the Olive Island and Heron Fund. I hope that answers your question. Terrific, thank you so much. So we only have two more minutes left and I'm looking through the remainder of the questions and there's so many, but there's one that I definitely want to ask. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is from an audiologist. So we've mentioned CMV several times. Um, she's an audiologist and started the first targeted CMV program in the state of Maryland, but most people don't know anything about CMV. I know. Will HLAA have any sessions about the most, uh, the most common cause of non-genetic hearing loss? Just a point of clarification. It is only when CMV is congenital, not acquired, that hearing loss is a risk. Correct. When a, when a baby is in utero and the infection occurs at that time. But um, HLAA, question for you, Amanda and team, is this a topic that you might consider for a session like this? Uh, we, we consider everything for our webinars. Um, you know, all you'd have to do is reach out to me with an idea, some presenters and, um, you know, a possibility to make that happen, absolutely. But as of now, at least our convention is in June 23rd through 25th. Um, 
and we have a series of workshops, but I don't think we have one that um, covers that topic. Terrific. So I know there are many more questions and we can't get to all of them. Feel free to reach out to me at ValerieJamesAbbott at gmail.com with your question and I am happy to direct it to the right place for the answer. Amanda, do you want to wrap us up? Sure. I just want to thank you, Justin, Valerie, and Christine for a really great presentation today. Um, thank you to our captioner, Stephanie, for uh, your amazing captions. Um, as we've said and posted in the chat, um, this will, was recorded and you can find it at hearingloss.org. There's a more specific website uh, for our recordings page um, that was posted in the chat. But thank you so much for joining us today. Please join us again for another uh, HLA webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much.